Good afternoon again. My name is Vinod and I'm a product manager with Microsoft. I work in a team called Visual Studio Team Services, which is basically our DevOps offering. And today I'm here to talk about, uh, you know, our journey uh, towards DevOps. This is not just about VSTS, but this is also about the 82,000 Microsoft employees actually moving to DevOps, right? So the journey includes three aspects. It talks about the culture, the process, and then tools. Uh, and just to set, set the expectation right, my presentation is not so much focused on tool right now because I saw there are plenty of demos happening here. The intent of this presentation is to talk about, you know, what we did, right or wrong. What are some of the learnings that you can take in your journey? Um, what are some of the mistakes that you can avoid? Right. Um, I um, have worked here in uh, Bangalore also previously, and I love the opportunity to come, you know, to this city. Just love this city, um, except for the fact that my in-laws also stay here. So. <laughs> And um, that's definitely not the reason I left the city, right? Um, and I hope this is not getting recorded, right? This, that is certainly also not the topic of discussion. I know a lot of you, I can see a lot of you smiling, right? Um, the only thing I can say about that is, you know, there are some challenges in life we cannot solve. We'll look at DevOps, okay? All right, so with that, let me give you a quick introduction of the team that I belong to, right? So uh, Microsoft has a big organization which is called Developer Division, right? Which has about 3,200 employees, and this is essentially all your Visual Studio, uh, you know, VS for Code, VS Mac, uh, Visual Studio Mobile Center, uh, and then obviously you know Visual Studio Team Services as well. Uh, so it's a large organization, and we are a part of that organization. So we are about 800, uh, a team of 800 people sp spread across the globe. Okay, so uh, we have a team in Redmond, we have a team in North Carolina, and then we have a team, um, you know, in Hyderabad as well, right? We have about 40 feature crews. So the size, you know, when I look at 800, it reminds me that my first company didn't have, you know, the total strength wasn't 800. Right? So it's a big team uh, spread across the globe, 40 feature crews working on you know various features um, this is the only slide i have about the product okay and i'm not going to sell vsts here because my intent is to talk about how we embraced devops right so visual studio uh, team services has two offerings uh, one is a tfs which is the on prem solution and the other one is vsts which is you know the cloud solution right it provides you source control. Uh, it provides you build, release, continuous integration, continuous deployment, package management, dashboard, analytics. So it's kind of an end-to-end -end solution, uh, you know, if you're looking at onboarding uh, to a DevOps offering. Uh, so that's the only slide I have on the tool. Then I have this slide, which actually talks about our internal journey. Like, as I said, there are about 82,000 Microsoft employees actually using VSTS as the DevOps tool. Um, this includes, you know, the largest, um, you know, the largest code base that we have uh, on Earth, which is Windows, basically. Uh, includes Windows, Office, um, you know, any team you name. I mean, there are 50,000 engineers actually working on, uh, you know, on a dedicated basis. So when you, what you look at, uh, when you look at this dedicated user, that means people using it continuously for 11 days in a month, right? When you look at occasional, these are people who come in for two days at least, right? And then there are uh, one day users as well um, who may be experimenting with it, right? So our journey so far has been good. Uh, you know, the way we have moved to almost 50,000 dedicated employees and it, it's a challenge, right? It's easier to sometimes move people outside the organization than inside. And in Microsoft, you have plenty of tools which have been, you know, kind of homegrown, right? So you really have to have a reason uh, to be able to move uh, these teams around. So let's now get into a journey. And this journey is about how we started, how this team started. So 
once upon a time you know we used to have this as the cycle which is two year release cycle so something that i that i'm working right now is actually going to get released in 2020 right it's going to be two years down the line i know exactly what that feature is going to be right so to be able to do that we had a huge planning cycle like months of planning right and then we had few milestones right where we would have some part of the product to be enabled for our customers the planning itself was a huge cycle i'm a product manager so this is my area i would be writing specs right so i would be spending like months writing specs and those specs would be nothing but you know 500 page document that the team is expected to go through and develop a product right but as i said the assumption was whatever i'm doing right now is going to get released two years down the line so i have to know what the customer is expecting two years from now it sounds funny right now you know when we when we think about it in today's time right and we also knew it was right right we knew because we have spent so much time we know this has to be right what happens to the development we had an equally long development cycle where people would write code and this code would be written months before it's actually going to be released right it's like the developer is writing it now and six months down the line we will actually have a release because there is a huge test and stabilize phase think about the plight of this developer where a tester comes at this stage and asks the developer hey here is a bug in the code can you tell me what is the problem with this, that code the developer has almost forgotten the code that you know he has written it's almost like me asking you like you know what's your marriage anniversary and then you're thinking oh, you know i don't remember right so it's it was that kind of a challenge right and think about the plight of a developer who is new so the developer who actually coded has left the organization and there is a new developer poor guy he doesn't even know what the code is but he has to look at you know what that bug is understand that code so it was a huge 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 debt for us then came the beautiful day right when we are going to release the the product so we had we used to have release candidates and then we would have release to market right which is the rtm and what happens we have done the planning we have done our first deliverable and now our beta is ready so we go out right we go out and we talk to the customers we are just waiting like i'm standing here and you are the customers and you know you're just looking at what this product is going to offer and i'm excited to know what's your feedback and then you come back and tell me that doesn't seem right you know what you've built doesn't seem right and we're like no but we spoke to you we took the requirements this can't be wrong right so what do we tell them we have to have an answer right so we tell them fine you know it's a great feedback we'll implement in the next two years because that's how our release cycle is right so we tell our customers wait we are booked solidly come back after two years right now think about if you were that customer we've had a lot of challenges we've not been able to give features that people have asked for we've not been able to prioritize so we realize that you know there is a problem with this right why did it work at the first place because at that point in time that is how products were developed like windows for an example was a three years release cycle right and it was fine it's almost like if i tell you 15th century if i were to tell you in, we are all in 15th century and i tell you that hey cars are going to be the most common way to commute you're probably going to laugh at me at that point in time right at the same time today if i tell you that horse is going to be the most common way to commute you're still going to laugh at me right so this fitted at that point in time and so it worked right but today it doesn't right this is anyways a statement so i'll skip through this is basically to say that hey you know with with the amount of agility that we are expecting in the business you know you can't work at the pace that you'd been working with right so what's the solution i am assuming everybody knows about this slide which is a standard sprint you know the scrums uh, you know diagram and i'm sure through the you know 3 days or 4 days you've been here you would have seen this right so this is the solution to the problem 
and that's also my last slide no <laughs> this is just the beginning we thought we will adopt this we heard like all of you we heard you know this is what we should do right so we said okay let's go to sprint model so what do you do you simply break the schedule right and this has like even even though it will not, not be perfect but the first step is to simply break the schedule we did so so we we decided we are going to break everything into sprints right and these sprints are going to be three week cycle why three any guess you know you are smarter than us because we didn't start with 3 weeks actually we started with 2 weeks first and then 4 weeks okay and in both the scenarios we realized that it's not working out right so you're smarter you figured it out in the first place right so <laughs> a good one so we started off with 2 weeks and then we realized it's not working we were not able to deliver enough increment right so we moved to 4 weeks but the 4 week cycle was a problem because if there's something that slipped beyond 4 week that meant another 4 weeks right so we said okay we're going to go get to a 3 week cycle which seems to be reasonable but we were scared of quality right we think about this like we had been doing this two year releases and one fine morning you know we wake up and we say hey we're going to do three weeks sprint like it's just going to be a very smooth transition right two years till yesterday let's switch to three weeks now right so that was the transition that we were going through so definitely not smooth what we figured out is that we do, we are not we are not confident we can deliver quality so we added a stabilization sprint like everybody does and these are by the way small waterfalls within the sprint which is where we also started right nothing new everybody does that now what happens we have two teams and this is actually by the way a practical uh, like actual on ground example that i'm taking obviously i can't name the team but there are two teams one of the team decides that they're going to build features they're just going to focus on features so they'll, they'll add feature on feature on feature they're excited developers want to build feature right so they went overboard and they started building the feature which is team b team a decided that while well, they're going to build feature but they're also going to make sure that there is not in you know more technical debt that is accruing because by the end of sprint 5 while there is a stabilization phase it is still a sprint right you do not want to accrue the uh, technical debt right so what happens team b is red okay because there is so much technical debt team a is green right so what do we do to team a we reward them no we actually punish them we told them go and fix their debt as well what do we do we have a you know limited timeline so we punish them right and you can imagine the level of motivation that team a would have right after knowing that they have to fix team b's debt by following all the process as it, as it was expected right definitely i don't want to be part of team a for sure <laughs> so today we are here today we are at three week sprint we don't have that you know long two year cycle and i'm going to talk about some aspect as to how we reached here right i'm sure this audience would have you know people from different background like you know program managers developers you know testers and i hope that there is something for everyone out here to take okay as i said at the start the large part of devops is about culture and people then the tools and that's why i am not covering tools uh, you know to the detail this is a pretty known statement so what did we do to change the culture we did not give people dan pink's book <coughs> by the way i don't know how many of you how many of you have read, read this book but it basically talks about the importance of autonomy the importance of mastery 
and having a purpose behind it, right? So we didn't give this book, but our thought process was kind of aligned to this, to say that we need to give autonomy to the team because creativity comes with autonomy. We need to give people a sense of mastery. For us, it was easy because I'm building a product which is VSTS, right? It's a product for DevOps. And if I'm not going to master that product, I cannot stand here and talk about it, right? So for us, the purpose came naturally because we were building that product. And obviously, you know, mastery, I'll talk about it, you know, how our teams do that. But let's look at what does that mean? What does autonomy mean? Because autonomy can also be risky, right? So this is one example that all of you may know about, which is, um, you know, Encarta um, and, you know, Wikipedia. The way Encarta came in was that, you know, huge business plan, well-funded, hiring the right people, you know, that they needed. And then Wikipedia, completely, you know, different model. People who are interested to contribute in their free time, not much of funding. And we all know what happened, right? And by the way, that was actually funded by Microsoft uh, in Qatar. So we all know what happened, right? So clearly, it's not the money that's working, right? You have to have something beyond, that, right? So, so this is what our guiding principles are. We have an organization which is of the size of 800 people. What that organization is going to look like? What are the roles that are going to be there in that organization? Which teams are going to be there like testing or CI, CD or work items? What cadence we are going to release product, right? Is it three weeks? Is it four weeks? Is it five? Is all alignment. Today, today, any of those 800 people, if you wake up any or any one of them middle of the night and ask them which is the sprint that is going on right now they'll be able to they'll be able to say s 132.2 anyone and that's it that's a challenge you know that i can take openly that's the taxonomy part of it how do we make sure that you know the entire organization is aligned on certain things right but without risking the autonomy so where does the autonomy comes the autonomy comes in how do you plan and how do you practice that? Which means as a product manager, I have full freedom to decide how that feature is going to be built. What are we going to do in that feature? And nobody can take that away from me, right? But am I going to run a four week sprint? Am I going to run a two week sprint? No, that's aligned at an organization. Am I going to run a sprint starting next week to, you know, the next three weeks? And the other team starting this week to the next three weeks, no, you don't have a choice there, right? So you have to have alignment and you have to have autonomy. This is from a taxonomy standpoint. So we do 18 months of planning, strategy planning. And let me just get to the next slide, actually. So we define epics, which are like at, you know, at the range of 18 months, something that we want to target for 18 months, next 18 months, right? For an example, if I were to decide, uh, you know, if we were to decide that we want to do something around functional testing, right? That's a large strategy, right? So we would probably take a call that this is what we want to invest in, right? In the next 18 months. From there, we decide what feature are going to be, uh, you know, part of that strategy, which is roughly around six months. From there, we come to feature chat. Feature chat is nothing but we do kind of a three sprint planning. We have a sprint for three, three weeks. We do a three sprint planning, which is what we call a feature chat, right? And then we have the sprint, which is three weeks itself. Now, what is interesting is we've also figured out what does it mean in terms of how accurate we will be on each of those. So if I were giving a strategy for 18 months, I know I'm somewhere at the ballpark of 60%. It, it would be only 60% that I'll be able to deliver. If I am doing a feature, which is six months, then I know it's probably around 80%, right? But when I come to feature chat, when I come to a sprint, I have much more clarity. I know that I can deliver 90% of that, right? And I'm not just saying it. Um, let me just... I have a few slides open, a uh, few pages open that I wanted to show you as well. Um, this is 
feature chat for all the 40 crew crew members that we have right uh, 40 crews that we have and this is only for the sprint that is going on right now right so everybody has to come with a feature come up with a feature chat and then we have a, a set of meetings where every you know gpm which is basically my boss right uh, who's going to talk about his feature chat uh, about his three feature crews and then everyone else is going to talk about that and we do it over like three meetings which are each for about two to three hours it is important because teams are distributed and there are dependencies across team right so that's the you know the, the feature chat part um let me just quickly okay um so this is the feature chat part that i said this is our sprint Three week sprint. So we have three week sprint, which starts at week one, completes on week three. Week fourth is a deployment, and our deployment um, happens in ring. So we have a progressive deployment, um, and I should probably show you, you know, what that really means. So these are the rings that we have. Okay, so these are the environments you can assume, right? And this is ring one, this is ring, you know, this is ring zero, one, two, three, four. We have seven rings, right? The idea here is that there are a lot of people who are sitting here in ring one. This is kind of a canary kind of a deployment where, you know, I have my MVPs, which are, you know, a community of people that we work closely with, right? This is us, us itself. Like, you know, one of this ring holds our code, the VSTS code itself. Like, can't be, like, being part of this team, you know, I feel so excited thinking that what I am developing is also actually getting deployed by VSTS, which means VSTS is being built using VSTS, right? So these are the rings where, you know, you would basically pilot test um, and, and, you know, get some of the early, early feedbacks out, right? And then you do a progressive deployment. So when I said the fourth week is deployment, in the five days, we would go from here till ring seven, right? And we intentionally delay you know, in that week, because you get service health related information. If there are issues, you would get, get issues as well. For an example, we had an issue uh, with, with our service, right? And since I'm talking about culture, let me, let me show you something that, and my only intent to show you this is because, as I said, a large part of it is actually culture, right? So we had an issue. This is, this is from my CVP, um, and he, he, he he's very active on the blog, right? And so we had an outage just a few days back, right? And he blogged about it. He blogged about, and this is all available in, in public to view, right? So he blogged about how there was, you know, an incident that happened and how we did a post-mortem of that and how that was available publicly for everybody to view, right? And the same post-mortem, which he's talking about, is actually here. So we talk about what was the customer impact, and it's all in public, right? We talk about what caused the initial failure? Why didn't the system auto automatically rec recover, right? And then what happened at the, you know, the application tier? What happened at the back end? All of this data is available for all of you to consume, for our customers to consume. So that's the kind of transparency that we are talking about. And it's a very important part of DevOps, right? It's not just about that three weeks, right? This is where the culture part of it comes in, right? So let me just go back again. Yeah. So the three week sprint, fourth week we deploy. And then while that is happening, we've already started on the next sprint. Right? We sp send sprint emails. Um, every, every feature crew has to send it by the end of the week third. Everybody has to send it. And all of these sprint emails are actually read by RCVP, which is great, uh, basically. But the idea here is to say that there is one, this is alignment. This is alignment to say that everybody in the team has an opportunity to know what's happening across a, you know, different feature group, right? So you have the opportunity to know that. But where is the autonomy? You decide how you want to send that sprint email, what you want to highlight. The sprint emails are usually about customer value and stuff, but you have freedom how you want to do it, right? But you have to do it, right? The other thing that I want to highlight is anything that we do, right? This is uh, 
a feature that I worked on. Okay. And this is actually a work item in BSTS. And this is my release notes of when that feature got completed. Right. I have to document that. Right. But once it is there, it it is available for anyone else to see. So let me just go and see where. Yeah. What I've put in my release notes is actually what the customer is going to see. So you saw this, which is the feature that I had added, you know, the one that I had worked on basically. It's on VSTS, which is also available publicly, right? So after every sprint, you can come here and see what we delivered. Anybody in the world, right? <clears throat> So that's that's another cadence that you know we follow as a team. So um, in terms of you know how that is getting picked up and how that is getting posted is something that is internal to us. But here's what I would say: it's a very lightweight process that we have built, and it's not even part of the product. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I said. Like, there's a lightweight process that we've built, which is basically going to collect that and then publish to our, you know, blog site. It's not part of VSTS, but it's part of our process. Sure. Sure. All right. Um, let me just make sure. Um, so this is what I spoke about, right? We also made organizational changes because you, like, it's not just about tooling, right? So what are the changes we made? We used to be a program management uh, development and a testing org, okay? And this might be a little sensitive, but this is our journey, right? It doesn't have to resonate with you necessarily, right? So we used to be a program management uh, development test, and each of them will be like a vertical reporting into, you know, the director uh, in each of these orgs, right? But what we realized was the challenge we had with that model was the accountability wasn't there. I, as a developer, would write code, throw off the wall, and say, you know, it's tester's responsibility, right? Test, it is tester's responsibility to test and provide the feedback. And those three months, I'm having fun time, right? Unless there is a bug. Uh, and it's the tester who is basically testing it. And once the tester is done, he has thrown it back to the operations to say, hey, you go deploy. I have done my job, right? We wanted to break that. We wanted to bring accountability. So we got, we, we got rid of a test as a um, as a role uh, or I would say, you know, um, as a specialized skill. Instead, we merged dev and test, right? Um, and, and that kind of became the, you know, we used to have SDETs, SDEs previously. Uh, we don't have any more, right? Um, as part of that transition, we had to let go of people uh, as well uh, because, uh, you know, a lot of work was uh, about manual testing and we had to let go of people as well. Um, and we also had opportunity for people to kind of reskill, um, but we were clear we wanted to have, you know, automated testing, right? A large part of it was, uh, you know, manual and we wanted to drive accountability, more important, right? It was about accountability. What you write, you own it, right? Um, and when we did that, basically, so this is just, you know, how a feature crew looks like, like my boss uh, has probably few PMs and then I am one of them. And then, you know, uh, my, you know, boss's engineering peer has, uh, you know, few uh, teams under him, leads, and then, you know, there is a feature crew. So I probably work with, you know, a feature crew on a particular product, right? Um, this is how the team looks like. Um, this is, uh, this, you know, the standard we think 10 to 12 is what works for us. Uh, thanks to those guys, you know, they've tried to control their laugh uh, while clicking that picture, but uh, you know, that's a team that sits in Redmond. Um, so what happened when we made that change? When we, when we kind of, you know, merged the dev and test. So we had a lot of tests which were manual, functional tests and stuff, right? And we wanted to get that automated, right? So this is how our test, lo test scenario looked like. This is how the test landscape looked like. This is, this is where we were previously. This is where we are today. Now, that L1, L2, L3, L4, I'll quickly tell you. L1 is basically a unit test. No dependency with anything. No network, no storage, nothing. It's just an independent unit test, right? Uh, we coined a term for L1 as well because we had a huge dependency with databases. So we said, 
we will have l1 test which are basically just using a database but we are going to run them very frequently right so that is what is l1 then we have l2 which is more of an api kind of you know integration testing kind of scenario and then finally l3 which is more of you know functional functional testing ui and things like that our belief is that we want to have as less l3s and l2s um compared to the l1s uh, and l0 we want to be high on the you know l0s and l1 right uh, today we run about 70000 tests every uh, pr build so as a developer when i make a change when i send a pull request there are going to be 70000 tests running uh, with that single pull request um and it includes both l0 and l1 test right and there are you can imagine there are 150 200 runs happening uh, in a day actually more than that actually more than that right so that was a huge transition and you know part of it is also because once we did that whole transition we wanted to basically have all of this automated right uh, less debt in the system yeah l1 is where backend comes in so we are a very heavy sql uh, you know dependent uh, service so that's where l1 comes in so this is how the quality was before right where you would have these stabilize and the debt has gone up this is uh, this is how it looks today which is after every sprint you know you go, you got to make sure your debt is controlled there is there's by the way a report i'll show you at the end of it uh, if you have more than x amount of debt the the team cannot take a feature period you cannot take a feature right so you got to put and that's again um, that's alignment autonomy what is that thank you yeah there's a lot of technical debt there yeah it's a lot of productivity as well because what was happening is the code merging is also going to happen here if you look at the previous model most of it is happening here right which means 40 different crews merging code here is a you know it's a pain right now that is happening here the third week everybody merge right and just to add to that we have a very lightweight branching model so for, first of all we don't use tfvc we use git okay uh internally and a lot of team use git and we accept it right git works for us we use git right uh but what we do is we have a very lightweight branching model which means there is only one master branch everybody is going to take from master i am not going to start my own branch and then work on it and then come back one fine day to say hey let's go and merge it right everybody has to work on master and everybody has to merge that small increment right and once the master is ready to be taken for a release we will take a real right so yeah when we do the release it's a release branch actually from where we are taking it right yeah yeah right sorry no no because the deployment is you know there are dris um, there are points of contacts for deployments as well so it's not that the entire team is basically involved in the deployment we have a small ops operations team as well that works very closely which is partly looking at the service health and everything else but you know they do help around that as well so it's during that one week it's not that my feature crew is actually doing the deployment it's a dev response since you asked that um yeah sure um this is where we are getting queries from customers this is today obviously i have been here there are 37 emails team is actually looking at it uh and responding this is a developer he's actually responding so the team is responding to the queries and then there is a dri as well okay so i'm going to skip through this one because i already spoke about the you know how people uh, basically create branch and we have a light you know branching model and then we basically merge 
Uh, the idea is also if you look at it, you know, the code is fresh in developer's mind. So if an issue comes, I know what happened, you know, what I did two weeks back versus saying, hey, six, six months back, I don't remember, right? I mean, we have hard time finding, you know, stuff that we place at home and stuff. So, you know, okay, so this is, this is something that we do, which is what we call feature uh, flag, right? And this has helped us immensely because the next question that should come is, what if I'm not able to complete a feature in three weeks? which is a common scenario. I, I speak to ton of startups and one of the common problems that they face is that they say the timelines are driven by customer. So if the customer says something has to be given in two months, we have a two month cycle. The customer says three weeks, we have a three week cycle, right? The problem there is the size of the feature. So we came up with something we call feature, uh, sorry, feature flag, right? What does that mean? Now is, assume this is my code, right? Which is today and it goes through a like, when I, when I go to a particular page and access a feature, it goes through this path, okay? Now I've decided that I want to enhance this feature. So what I do, I actually start working on it separately in the same code base under a feature flag. Okay, so feature flag is nothing. I mean, if, if I were to say simply, it will be an if condition where my code would basically branch out, right? Obviously, there are optimizations behind in terms of how we handle it at application layer or, or the database layer, but it's simply saying that I'm going to branch it up, right? Now, this is not visible to anybody. This is still not complete, right? Then what I, my feature flag is still off for most of the customers. They can't see it. They can't see this workflow. I am continuing to build on this and I might just test it within the team as well, right? I am now ready because I've completed this feature, but I'm still not ready to release it to the customer for everybody as a default, right? So then what I do is at account level, I can enable that workflow. So in VSTS account is like, you know, I as a user, if I want a particular, you know, a subscription with five users, I would go and uh, register myself and create an account. And then I can set up a team of, you know, X number of people or, right? So now, since the feature is complete, I can redirect few users here who can start testing it and providing us the feedback. It's still the same code base that is getting deployed, right? Now I'm confident that this works for everyone, right? And at that stage, I might, you know, switch on the feature flag by default and now everybody is flowing through this, right? But my previous feature is still there. It's still there. It's a debt also, right? And we don't let it uh, grow large, right? So what we do is we just get rid of the previous feature, right? And then this becomes the default workflow, right? And trust me, this has helped us immensely because you can't complete a feature in three weeks. No, it doesn't matter. You would still have to check into master. It would still have to be there in the, in, in the master. It would still have to be deployed. You come back in the next sprint, start from there. Right. It helps us in testing because, you know, I can give you alternate flows and say, hey, you, you know, you are certain set of customers who can go and basically test, uh, you know, this new feature and give us your feedback. Right. Uh, by the way, if you're using, so this is just an example to say that I have enabled it for these two accounts. For one, I have enabled the feature. The other one, it is off. So one would basically go through the flow and, you know, be able to see the new feature. The other wouldn't. It will still be in the master. No. So the, the, the point there is that unless that feature flag is enabled, right, you don't go through that workflow and that feature, yeah, that feature flag, you could limit and say, Hey, it's just going to be MVPs. It's just going to be my team. It's just going to be a few set of folks. And if it breaks, breaks, because the whole expectation is that, you know, there is a new feature. You just want to have a look at it, right? Look, as I said, we are moving towards L uh, zeros. I cannot move my code beyond PR. Like I can, if I send a pull request, it will get rejected if it doesn't have test. Compliance. So PR, you can, you can set the compliance and it will run all the tests. If there are failures, you need to go and fix it before you can, you know, move to CI. So if, so reviewers would not even look at it, right? The second thing is that when you look at our PRs, we will have failures. 
it will be around 70 75 percent so test will fail there right but when it comes to ci you will see suddenly that it is around 95 96 percent right because you've reduced all your um, you know bugs within the pr itself right which is your pull request right and by the time people reach to ci it's a much more mature uh, you know um, service um, but we still have failures right we still have failures so in the interest of time so this is also the last section uh, everything that we do we measure also right and measure on three parameters we measure on operationally how it is doing we measure on business you know kpis we measure on how that feature is basically being used right and every pm has a responsibility to basically look at that data right so instead of me showing you you know these slides which is basically our stats around the service and stuff uh, this is the root cause analysis again publicly available this is the dash you know this is this what software engineering uses so you can see number of large scale incidents for every team number of uh, you know the bugs that each developer has you can see red where we already know that you know people need to basically go and fix it otherwise they can't move you know proceed further so these are some of the things that we track at operational level as well right um few things that i want to show, show you before i get to the summary part which is this is our dashboard um and it refreshed sorry but the, those boxes that you saw, saw there they are environments where all the code for master branch is going um and it's basically testing for uh, you know 10 to 20 these are all builds these are all the builds right and then we have uh, you know obviously some error so this is the default for for an example an engineering manager to just have a look at how the quality is across all the environments right um since i spoke about um, telemetry i mean this is just one of the features that i basically uh, we enabled right and i can see actually how many people are actually coming and basically hitting that that kind of stuff so you need to know how the usage you know how your service is actually being used is it really valuable and things so there's a lot of focus on telemetry i mean um this just to make sure that uh everybody is basically telemetry is like a default uh component of your specification you got to know what you're building is something that you know will be used so every everybody has to do this so that is there from you know operational perspective business and other other uh you know aspects as well i'm just thinking is there anything else um that i wanted to show you before yeah cool so um yeah perfect on time right um sorry where is the deck so we probably don't need the deck in summary we didn't do it in 6 months right we didn't do it right at the first place right and we are not done yet right it's going to take time right it's a journey at every stage you have to figure out if there is waste like we've figured out you know we've been spend, spending time on manual testing let's uh, you know invest in automation right you you got to like you know keep it going because it's going to be a journey right and all i can say is all the best from microsoft for your journey and if there's anything that we can help with we would love to thank you so much Thank <laughs> you.